Welcome to another episode of I Catch Killers. A warning for our listeners, today's conversation may leave you feeling upset, but I think also inspired by our guests' resolve to fight for someone they loved. Can you imagine what it would feel like to have someone you love just disappear? A member of your family just doesn't come home? Disappears without a trace? I can't even comprehend how you would deal with that, and I've been working in a field where that happens way too much. Sadly, today's guest on I Catch Killers experienced that loss, not knowing what happened to their beautiful son, Matthew Levison who disappeared on the 23rd of September 2007. They were also asked by police to assist in a murder investigation set up to investigate their son's disappearance. They endured the pain of sitting through a murder trial where the person accused of murdering their son was acquitted. Still not knowing what happened to Matt or where his body was, they continued to fight for justice for their son. That included challenging the police, lobbying the coroner, and spending their spare time randomly searching the national park with picks and shovels looking for their son's remains. They also had to make the impossible decision whether to accept the person accept the person responsible for Matt's disappearance should be allowed to go free in exchange for recovering Matt's body. No one deserves this pain that the Leveson family have gone through, but as a di- direct result, and only because of how hard they fought, they managed to get Matt's body back 10 years after his disappearance. Welcome to I Catch Killers, Mark and Faye. Hi, Gary. Gary, good morning. Thank you. Good to see you guys, and uh, thanks for coming in. It's a uh, it's a difficult topic, but I think uh, people are going to learn a, a great deal. It's important. Hopefully, this will help others as well. So that's uh, we're quite pleased to do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, to put put it out there, never take no for an answer from the police. Question, question, question. I think that's one thing that's uh, come come through with your fight to uh, get justice uh, justice for your son is the fact that you guys just kept pushing and pushing. And uh, quite frankly, if you didn't, uh, we wouldn't know what happened to Matt. Yeah, giving up wasn't an option. And, uh, you know, we had to fight for Matt because uh, he couldn't fight for himself. And uh, as Faye said, your, your roadblocks kept being put in our way the whole our whole journey. And we just focus on one, knock it down and can move on to the next one. And you have to. Yeah. Just so people understand where, where we all fit in and the relationship we've got, I think it's fair to say that uh, we're, uh, we're rather close now. Uh, I, the shared experience that we had when I came in uh, on the investigation in, uh, I think it was around 2014, yeah. at uh, one stage to reinvestigate uh, Matt's disappearance. And uh, so we've developed a relationship, a volatile relationship, I'd say, say at times. But a the, respectful one. A respectful, yeah, a respectful one. one. I uh, mean, we'll, we'll defend you till our dying breath. Yeah. I, I'd go as far as to say you're more than a friend, you're part of our family, family. now. Well, thanks, guys, and I, I, I feel that way. So when uh, the listeners are listening to our conversation now, if we're, we're talking shorthand, that's where it's come through mm. because uh, we've been through uh, a rather emotional uh, experience in uh, trying to uh, find out what happened to uh, what happened to Matt. So let's talk about Matt first of all. I, I'd like people to understand uh, who Matt was and how he fitted into your family. Well, he was our second. He was born on the 12th of December in 1986. He was our little ray of sunshine. Matt wanted to come into the world quickly and unfortunately he lived a short life. Um, He was just our little prankster, our little elf at Christmas time. He loved Christmas. I always tell people that. He he helped me put up the decorations. He loved the Christmas atmosphere. He loved birthdays. But most of all, he loved his pranks. You never know, knew what to expect. You go to the toilet and you put the seat down, there'd be it's bang because you had this little device under the seat or <laughs> a spider had jumped down at you from noise being made. Um, he loved astronomy. He he loved getting out in the, the wild. Out, out yeah. We used to four-wheel drive. He loved that. He loved life. I mean, as a child, he was a bit... Um, um, shy, but when he got into high school, he blossomed and he became this like a butterfly just out there. He loved to yeah. party, he loved his friends, he was always, always organizing something to do. He, yeah. ju- he just loved life the fullest. And how did he fit in with his brothers, Peter and Jason? Great, great. They, uh, it was three, as a middle, with, with, he was yeah. a middle son. With three boys, there was often <laughs> fights and uh, there'd be no. odd, odd one out, but uh, <laughs> oh. it just took one boy to be away. It didn't matter which one, it was just so quiet. And uh, uh, that said, although they, they'd have their, their arguments and, and, and uh, disagreements, um, yeah, they'd still stand by each other whenever there was a problem. They were issue. very close. As, as, as brothers, brothers should be. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. was the age difference? Uh, let's see. Well, uh, Peter, our eldest, is two years older than that. Yeah. And uh, Jason, our youngest, is three years younger than that. Yeah. 
and they're all their birthdays are within six weeks of each other. And at one stage there, because Jason's five years younger than Peter mm. and three younger than Maddie, it was like, oh, he's he's too little, you know. <laughs> he, he, well, he can't one. come to the pub or he can't do this, you yeah. know. We don't want him hanging around sort of thing. Yeah. And um, they were just getting so close again now because it was just before Jason's 18th birthday and Matt's 21st and they were planning to legally go, <laughs> go yeah. to a club and, and hang out together as they could as brothers. And that, that was but, around the time of Matt's uh, yeah, disappearance. Yeah. So uh, he, he was uh, 21 at the time? Matt was 20. Yeah. Um, Jason would have been turning 18. And they so plan, planned yeah, it a few weeks after and that. And so obviously uh, Jason's 18th birthday wasn't a, a non-event. How could it be? Yeah. How, how could it be with his brother gone yeah. and nobody knowing what had happened to him? Um, so, yeah, from a family that loved family get-togethers and having parties over the – since Matt's um, – it's been nothing really. So the, no. the worst time for me is Christmas time because Matt's birthday, although it's individual to Matt, um, nobody else is joyous. It's just our family should have been if Matt was there. Yeah. Whereas Christmas time, everybody's happy. Yeah. And we've got this missing uh, person for our table, one, one empty chair at our table. Just, uh, just that, and I, I think that brings a reality of it. Like I, I'm assuming, like most families, everyone had their their seat at the table, and uh, the there's point. an empty seat where, where yep. Matt right. should have been. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. empty seat there, except one year Faye's asshole cousin sat in that seat. But uh, <laughs> other, uh, well, <laughs> we won't go into that. We won't we go know. into that. We can. Yeah. We can. <laughs> 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 but, uh, no. yeah, we no. might. Uh, yeah. We'll we'll explore that <laughs> off uh, off tape. But you know, I've got fond memories of Maddie sitting around. I I did a lot of cooking and that, yeah. and I had a chocolate fountain so I had all the lollies and fruits and everything else and he'd sit there with his brothers and cousin and they they just you know pig yeah. out on this chocolate fountain sort of thing because that always came out at family events and I've got fond memories of him there just sitting there laughing and having a good time and even one time with his partner before it um dancing around the 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 kitchen island um, to the lion sleep tonight. So well, I hear that song. It takes me back to him and Daniel just dancing around the the kitchen island yeah. and you know having a great time. Yeah. We um, should explore that more too because which put up uh, Matt's male partner. Matt was gay. Yeah, and yeah. that was never a problem for the family. Yeah, it was yeah. never an issue for us at all. So uh, we had suspicions yeah. before he came out officially. And oh, but, I, I yeah. think par- par- yeah. parents would yeah. know. When did he? When did he uh, feel comfortable coming out? And oh, how, how did he come out? That was the worst. Yeah. That was the worst because we'd known since he was about three or four. Yeah. Four. And um, he'd been coming around with with his partner and Marcus said. Are they more than friends? I, th- I think so. <laughs> Very and perceptive. So, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm a bit slayer, so. <laughs> and um, the night before the HSC, Matt had a, 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 this ritual. He'd clean up his room and then get yeah. a little bit messy. Then he moved the bed around and reorganised it anyway. He'd, he'd been handling the HSC really good and um, he cleaned up the room and he said, I'm going over to Daniel's and um, okay, okay. And then he went and thought no more of it. Yeah. And um, then I get a text, Mum, I've left an envelope on my on my desk. All <laughs> right. Okay. My heart my heart sank. The first thought, hysterical mother, he's gone out to to take his take his yeah. own life. Yeah, he, well, he uh, can't he can't handle yeah, it. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. ah, right, right because you because you would as a parent see the pressure he's under not yes. being yeah. able to be yeah. who and he I'm really thinking, is. It um, couldn't be because he, he hasn't he hasn't showed any signs. Am I a slack mum? What have I missed? Anyway, I opened it and there was this beautiful letter thanking us for sending him to the school he had mm. went to. He had great friends and they've all been supporting him and they know he's gay. I'm gay, but I have to get that off my chest because yeah. I'm about to do the HSC. Yeah. So I just text him, get your butt home. <laughs> you know, yeah. it doesn't it doesn't matter. No, of course it, of it, course doesn't, it doesn't matter. And um, I cried. I, I cried yeah. a lot, but I didn't cry because I was upset he was gay. I was crying because I was worried about him. And I used to say to him when they go clubbing, "Be careful, Maddie. I don't want. We're going to find you." 
dead in the gutter. Because of, because of the, the yeah. gay lifestyle. Yeah, or, the gay bashing. Part, part of the gay, gay lifestyle yeah. for, for young males mm. is the, the partying and the, the yeah. you know, party drugs and everything else that yeah. go, goes with that. I can understand from a parent's point of view being concerned, nothing to do with the fact that he's gay. Yeah, that, but it's going to be a slightly harder path in life. Exactly. These not not just so much that, but also the fact that uh, uh, the, you know, the, the um, homophobic people out there who yeah, were scared of perhaps a gay bashing. Yeah, that yeah. was a problem too. Was what was on the back of our mind, and that that, that would be a real concern for a parent um, because it, it's yeah, it's not just the difficulty, of, but it's these biases that uh, society carries. Exactly. Yes. Um, mm. And yeah, you know, uh, we, we say that we don't carry it, but it's still there. It's getting better. And I know, like the actions of you guys, uh, I, I know you're a, a big participants in the Mardi Gras. Well, that's a funny thing because <laughs> we, yeah, for years and years, I've always thought I'd love to go and watch Mardi Gras yeah. one night. And who'd ever thought, you know, for the last 10 years, we've actually marched in it? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we marched with a group called P Flag. It's the Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays. Yeah, and, and they're beautiful. We were one of the few non gay groups marching in Mardi Gras. Yeah, yeah. And it's touching. You walk up Oxford Street yeah. and you see men. I'm 62. I yeah. mean, older than me, probably in their 70s. Yeah. Look at you holding their heart. Yeah. Because in those days they couldn't come out. Yeah. It's just yeah, so they touching. Put your arms out to hug you, so you go over and give them a hug, and, yeah. and even some of the young ones. That, that, yeah. That's that's beautiful. It's got to that point, and yeah, uh, it, I know around that time because I've known you for a few years now, and I know it's a, a big uh, a, a big um, moment for each year. And it it's is. a celebration of uh, Matt's lifestyle too. It is. It we, is. We, that's where we do it to, to help uh, or to, I guess, honour Matt. Uh, mm. And also if it helps other young boys and girls um, not be afraid to come out, great. Yeah. I Like I didn't know Matt obviously um, before his death, but what I did uh, draw something from was uh, during the inquest and it was a stressful time for uh, everyone, obviously uh, you guys. But his friends his that friends turned are up, fantastic. What they, what a classic group of people. We that call night. them our other gay sons now yeah. because he, Matt, you've seen them yourself. And his friends, all these years, yeah. the loyalty to Matt for, from them, it's it's unquestionable. Yeah. It really, they is. didn't have to show up. They showed up every day they could. Yeah, and and. We and didn't ask them to. They don't, they wanted to. And what and you didn't see too, they all came. Most of them came through the trial as well. Yeah, yeah. And we still see them socially as often as we were able I, to. I just thought it said so much about Matt, who at the time of his death, ten years later, his his friends were there supporting him in the way that they did, and testimony uh, testimony to the type of person Matt was, the quality of the people there. And they were some of the funniest people I've, I've oh, ever met. They had they are gorgeous. Oh, yes. 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 like to take the pressure out of a, uh, of an a pressure situation and inquest when they were offering advice to one of my um, work partners, John, on his hairstyle yeah. and what they could do oh, with Mr. his hairstyle. Gray. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if we could just and I'm seeing John sit there. It was it was classic. And I think they even had the magistrate in stitches talking about uh, Matt's hairstyle or the oh, colour of his. Well, hair. there was Which times Mr. there. Mr. Gray about his hair. Yeah, yeah there there's times you saw her on it, and she. Really Really had to look down. You could see she was holding back laughter. Yeah, no, a serious lady, but even she yeah. saw the humour in it. So I thought thought that was great. But uh, so yeah, it's it's clear that Matt had his life ahead of him, um, yeah. and he was a beautiful person. He was making plans. He was yeah. he was talking to work colleagues about perhaps buying a new car, maybe travelling overseas, working overseas. So he had a you know, um, a lot of plans for the future. He um, did before he met it. Um, he well, Atkins. Um, he did a lot of travelling. Yeah. And when he met Atkins, it all stopped. Yeah. And then the clubbing started. And because him and his partner before that, they used to get on, have their two laptops side by side and wait for happy hour with yeah. um, Jetstar. Yeah. And they get cheap flights, $25 flights down to Tasmania. They went to New Zealand. They went to Melbourne. They were always Thailand going as well. somewhere. Yeah. So full of life. And I think at that, that stage, from a parent's point of view, you would look, well, our job's done here and yeah. now it's, it's time for him to explore the world. And, yes, uh, he was working different jobs in that stage and he'd... Uh, I had a few different different uh, places he'd worked at, and yeah. uh, he enjoyed them all. And he'd worked at uh, Big W since since high school days, and uh, yeah. had good friends there. And uh, and he loved his loved all the jobs he had. He used to like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now we talk, and you've said Atkins, and I'm, I'm happy we'll refer to him as Atkins throughout. But that's Michael Atkins yep, that's um, right. that uh, was charged with Matt's murder. Um, he was acquitted of that charge, and we'll we'll go into more detail on that. But just so people understand, when we're referring to Atkins, and uh, he was the person that uh, on the back of the uh, coronial inquest that led us to where Matt's body was buried. Now there was concern, and I know this through the investigation that uh, 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 Matt had a partner before that, and then uh, 
they broke up for whatever yeah. reason and then his new partner was uh, uh, Atkins and uh, there was a significant age difference, I believe. Yes, yeah. there certainly was. Matt was, um, what, 19 at the time when you met him? Gee, that 20, sounds right, yes. You're 19. Mm. Um, I'm 60. Yeah. Michael Atkins is 50, 57. 57. Right. Mm. So okay. Matt thought at the time that he was 36 yeah. when, in fact, he was 46. So Atkins had... That taken ten years off. Uh, the kids, a lot of uh, black the, hair the, dye. He, um, he's buffed from being in the gym. Yeah. The kids yeah. thought um, he was. Yeah. Yeah. He, he never let the other other boys see his license or his wallet in case yeah. they found his ID. Yeah. Uh, he lied about his age to all all the young boys and yeah. um, trying to pass himself off as many years younger than he actually was. It's yeah. treacherous, isn't it? Really, it, it's exploitive. Yeah. Um, see, yeah. when we yeah. first met him, um, they'd been going out for a little while before we met him for dinner for the first time, and uh, he was he was discussing his taste in music. Yeah. And he just didn't realise it was our music. <laughs> right. So. And the funny thing about Atkins, and you could ask any of the people who'd met him through us, all the adults, he'd never look you in the eyes. Yeah. But yeah. all the kids, he'd look the kids in the eye. Yeah. But he yeah. would never look an adult in the eye. You could never engage him in deep conversation. Always very, very shallow things about his work or uh, nothing personal. Um, yeah, he was very hard to get information from. So it would be fair to say from a parent's point of view, you guys weren't happy with the relationship, no, but we knew- in the same regards... A parents, a child. The, well, the age, he's, he's Matt's choice. With yeah. all, if, if we say to Matt, uh, you know, because Matt was strong-willed, if you yeah. can't see him, Matt will say, get nicked and he's yeah. off. So, yeah. so um, it was, it we just had to accept him yeah. on the face page. He was up at our house many times for barbecue lunches yeah. or yeah. dinners but and things. But it was things. always short. He he was always very uncomfortable around us, Atkins. Right. Uh, as soon as dinner was over, it's come on, Matt, we're going. Yeah. And this one mm. particular night, I said, no, it's okay. I'll take, we'll take yeah. Matty home. He goes, no, no, I've got to go to work. Matt can come home. I said, no, I I, and poor Matt's just sitting there. Yeah. And in the end, he said, okay. And um, so he left and Matt didn't want to go home that night. Yeah. Uh, we'd had warning bells. Well, I had warning bells months before he went missing that I knew something was wrong because every time we did see him, his hug goodbye was tighter and tighter. Right. And that last hug, that last kiss I had with him, I'll always treasure because it was at a, his mate's 21st down at um, Shell Harbour said, I love you, Mum, I love you. And the hug seemed to go on for a long, long time. And then we later found out that they'd argued coming down there that Atkins didn't want to be there. He never wanted to go to yeah. family things, but Maddie loved family get-togethers. And that and was the last time you got yep. to speak to Matt. That, that was the last time. I Look, it's, I, I can't even comprehend sort of breaking it down and going, going through what you've been through, but I think to give a sense and give a sense of what you have been through, at what point in time and how did you find out that uh, Matt was missing? Through a work colleague. Jason was at home. He had glandular fever doing... Jason, say, Matt's younger brother. Matt's yep. younger brother doing the HSC and he got a phone call and um, he said, oh, mum's not here. And she said, I'll get mum to ring me. This, so, is, the, this is the Tuesday morning. Yeah. Okay. So the... the the time it was a Saturday that he was last seen, yeah. or he was last hours seen sun, early hours of the Sunday morning, Sunday morning. leaving the Ark yeah. Night Club um, at Darlinghurst okay. with, with Atkins. And, and that's uh, for people that don't know the the, the Ark Night Club. It's a it's a, a gay club, gay club. for, for yeah. men mainly. But, is oh no, both, a mix? both yeah. and straight straight yeah. go okay. there. Because well. other Saint Peter we used to go there too, so right. it's gay okay. and straight. Yeah. Okay, and that was where he was last seen alive. So yeah. you'll. He's moved out of home at this stage, yeah. but in regular contact with you guys. Yeah, well, at first there wasn't because 12 months before he did go missing. Right. But we were found, he was found within 24 hours and we later found out it was Atkins he was with. And when Atkins was pressured with the police, to cut a very long story short, when he first went missing the first time, we rang the police, they came straight over. Yeah. And then we, because we'd been searching everywhere, ringing yeah. friends and that, and he wasn't answering his phone. And one of his friends said, oh, he was meeting this Michael, Michael Atkins at um, the Ark nightclub. Yep. Anyway, the police uh, finally tracked him down and he denied it. Right. He denied seeing Matt. And then he said, oh, yeah, I saw him for five minutes, said hello, and that was it. Yeah. And it turned out it wasn't just it. He, Matt had been out with Atkins and then after that, Matt got really cranky with me that, that I'd rung the police yeah. and that. And when he phoned me at about 3 o'clock 
that morning to say he was, you know, he was around, he was at a friend's place. I said, you've got to get down to the police station. No, 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 no. So yeah. he, he, there was a bit of tension there. So it took a couple of months after that. Yeah. But he never really came home after that. He'd come for visits and that. Yeah. But he would just told us he was living at his, his friend's place. Mm. We later found out he was living out of his boot at his friend's place. His fr- friend Atkins, Michael Atkins, who loved him, wouldn't even give him a key to get into the unit. He used to have to wait on the step for Atkins. So he had right. his hooks in him from the beginning. Yeah, yeah there's a bit of power indifference there, yeah. isn't there? Yeah. So that was a phone call to your house. Yeah. Spoke to Matt's younger, uh, was a work colleague of Matt's and spoke to uh, Jason. He went to sleep again because yeah. he, he was really, really cruel. Yeah. And then they rang again. Yep. And, and said he hadn't turned up so, for work but, basically yeah. on the Tuesday. And I, I rang Jason, I think it was about the one o'clock, I'm not too too sure on the time, to see how he was. And he goes, oh, by the way, Mum, one of Matt's work colleagues rang to say he hadn't turned up at work. Yep. Panic stations, mm. we're ringing around everybody. And keep in mind, too, this is the Tuesday. So how do you react well, with that? Like Matt's, it's, but Matt, Matt's work week yeah. was Tuesday to Saturday. He had the Monday off. Right. So this was his first day back at work after the weekend mm. when, when his work started to call and see, well, where's, where's Matt? And we did know that he loved this new job he had and uh, he's working at a call centre at NRMA and uh, he quite he liked his colleagues there and he, he enjoyed the work and uh, um, there's no way he'd not be character. there or, or, or you know, not tell them he wasn't coming to work. So they said it, if was going to be odd. late with traffic, he'd always ring up, so I'm going to be 10 minutes late. Yep. And they told Atkins it was the, his duty of care to ring and if they weren't going to ring the police, he wasn't going to ring the police, they would. So right. they rung us and then... We did a bit of a search around because we thought, oh. Because they rang Atkins, had they? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm not. No, sorry. I think Atkins had actually actually rang NRMA to see if he'd turned up. Knowing so, full well that he's yeah. not going to turn up, yeah. Yeah. what we know now. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And so as a parent, your uh, 20-year-old son has uh, disappeared. You've tried to phone his phone, I would imagine, and phone his friends and everything. Yeah. That- yes. Yeah, so as, as the day progressed, we, Faye and I were talking to Matt's friends and, and – uh, uh, they hadn't seen Matt, but they were spreading the word for us as well. And, and through the afternoon, the early evening, we're getting answers from people. No, nope, no one's seen Matt. No one's seen Matt. And uh, um, so I spoke to Atkins. It would have been late evening, I guess. But before that, Peter was uh, getting off work early, and he was going to drive around the uh, Kings Cross, yeah. Surrey Hills, and see if he could see Matt or contact yeah. friends. And Atkins was going to go with with Peter, and at the last minute, he pulled the pin. So yeah. he didn't. So Peter went driving round with with his uh, then partner, mm. looking for me. When when mm. did it get to the point that you guys were thinking the worst? That night. Yeah. That night. Yeah. It was not like him. I, I could understand if he didn't want to ring his parents. Yeah. As most eighteen yeah. year old yeah. kids, you know. Um, um. But when he wasn't answering Peter or his mates, I knew there was something wrong. I I had this gut feeling there was something wrong. Yeah, I knew there was an issue, but I didn't. I didn't feel the worst at the start. Right. Um, yeah, that was on the. So on the Tuesday evening, um, we decided that we've got to involve the police here. So uh, I rang and said, "Look, we're going to head down to the Southern Police Station and make a formal report about yeah. Matt." And uh, you're the last person we know who's seen Matt, so you make sure you're there. He was very reluctant to go. Yeah, I bet you he was. Yeah, and, uh, but he did. He, he we got in there. So look, yeah, you've got to be there. So uh, we met outside threat. the police station and. Uh, mm. The odd thing was we spoke to a young constable at the counter and uh, gave him our details. They asked for your, your full name, date of birth, your address and, and, and licence details and uh, um, he took, took notes. So when he asked for Atkins details, mm. Atkins didn't answer him verbally. He had all written down a bit of paper and passed it across the counter. Yeah. Now, I wear glasses, but back then I could see a bit of distance vision okay. Yeah. I could see on, on, on the bit of paper, right. and that's when it confirmed the massive age difference between the two of them. Right, so it, it confirmed that he'd been lying to you and probably more yes. importantly yeah, Matt, Matt about, yeah. about his yeah. age. And the funny thing about it was he was really agitated. He didn't want to be at that police station. He was sweating. He was yeah. marching up and down. He couldn't stand still. But I, I, I suppose from a parent's point of view and the world that you're, you've lived in, you're not going to suspect something as sinister right from the start. No, no, no. That's just, you, this you, is, there's a not uh, – uh, obviously you don't trust him, you don't mm. like him, but yeah. you're not thinking, yeah, he's actively involved in um, this. And as the, this progressed, this is Tuesday, on the Wednesday, Southern Police Station had carriage of the matter. Yep. Uh, they were working on it and then they told us they were transferring the case to Miranda 
I think it was the Thursday. Yeah. Um, so this tu- report Tuesday night? Yeah. yeah Thursday. Yeah, still no that. Yeah. got transferred to the Miranda on Thursday. We were asked to go to do an interview at Miranda Police Station on the Thursday afternoon. Can I yeah. just ask you guys how you were even functioning at that stage? Don't know. We Auto did. Pilot, you, things you just yeah. got to do. You, 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 and we always said it from the very start, if we curled up in a ball in the corner, yeah. and that was never going to happen. So right. we, we just do what we have to do. We were, we were working because it was Mark's busy, it busy was. season. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mark's a tax agent. Yeah. And so we had to keep the business running because we had to pay bills, but we still had to look for our son. So we're, we're cramming all this into 24 hours, no yeah. sleep, no nothing. We, if we weren't working, we were looking for Matt. And it just it just was a vicious circle. I mean, on, on the Tuesday night when Peter was looking for Matt, down at, was going to go yeah. looking for Matt in, 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 near the Ark, I had clients at um, French's Forest. Yeah. So I actually came back via the city and I, I drove around the uh, Darlinghurst area near the Ark looking for Matt's car. I look I, Just I'm, in case I might, I might see his car. Can't even comprehend how you function under that in those circumstances, but I suppose if you put in those circumstances like you guys had, you had to function. Yeah, if, that's it. Yeah, if before this occurred, I, I couldn't. I'd be like, I think, how could you do all that? But yeah. when you're thrown into it and it's your child, of course you, you just do it. it. When it's your child, there's so, that, that fight, fight for his survival, fight to find what's happened yeah. to him, fight and for we, your own. We'd survival. do it for Jace. We'd do it for Pete. So yeah. it and wouldn't that, matter. And, of and that, that, that's another thing too. We had to had to consider our other two boys as well so yeah. we'd make sure they were all right and they were upset and they they didn't want to talk and they were angry and upset and trying to to cope with them and cope with us and not cry in front of them and try and be strong in front of them all the time and at night time there was no sleep you just yeah. just lay on your pillow mm-hmm. and you just cry your eyes out so and the, see this is now I'll go back to the our time a time yeah. frame on and on the Friday, we're told by the police at Sutherland, uh, sorry, at Miranda, we're also going to involve homicide. Um, don't think the worst. Um, we just involve them because they've got more investigative powers than, than, than experience than, than yeah. we've got. So we said, well, okay, fair enough. And we met the homicide people who were staying to work on the on look at the case. Yeah. And then on the Saturday morning, um, the police officer Miranda we knew yep. and the detective for homicide came to our front door. Right. And that's when they said to us, I'm sorry, um, On the we front fear the worst. Step. We're looking we're looking for remains, not Matt. We, we fear he's met with foul play. And that was on our front doorstep. We've uh, not even come inside No, I had the whole thing out. And that, that was Tuesday and we're talking the Saturday. Saturday, yeah. yeah. How, uh, yeah, had the whole thing out. Yeah. I under, understand stand that. And uh, how did you process that? You didn't. You were numb. We well, confirmed what Faye already knew because she she was convinced that she she already realised that was just the outcome. And I guess it also I was thinking that way as well, but I wasn't trying to admit that at that point. But it was uh, surreal. It was mm. like, no, this isn't happening. This can't be. This can't be right. It's just I, you just you can't process it. You just you just you're in a, like a zombie state. I, I can't I can't even put into words how you feel. It's all your worst nightmares come into fruition. Um, it's like your heart's been ripped out. You've got no nowhere to go, nowhere to turn. Um, it's just this horrible emptiness just comes over you. I, I, I would imagine with that emptiness you'd be having hope too that this oh. is just a nightmare that I'm going to wake up from and we always and had hope Matt's mm. going to walk in the door and uh, well that was the thing you know, we had to have Faye, hope. You know, we, we thought well, if we a lot of people use the word closure to us mm. and um, it's probably the worst word that any victim can hear closure sounds like a nice neat little bow everything's tied in a, in, mm. a, in a pile and a, a bow tied on top but closure to us is nothing less than Matt knocking our front door saying sorry I haven't called that's yeah. closure. Yeah. Um, if we get justice, if we get some answers, that's the best you can hope for. But yeah. n- n- I mean, people say closure, meaning meaning well, mm. but it's an insulting word. Well, uh, and I have to thank you guys for that because you, you taught me that. And uh, I've been doing homicide investigation for a long time and uh, I, I think I, I said it in the frame of uh, I, I hope we can bring closure and you, you jumped on me about it and I, I thank you for it. And uh, I've been educating other police and making sure that the public or people understand that there's never any closure in yes. a situation like Correct. this. And, and Correct. And even um, time frame, there's no no time frame. People, like we lost friends over it. Uh, they didn't know, know how to, to talk to us. We had people cross the road. I had a really good friend. Um, her son was 
friends with our eldest son and she used to hide in the supermarket from us. She'd see us and she'd run. And they didn't know how to approach you. I, I, I've heard people use the term, the term and when we're talking missing persons and this was something that uh, I learnt through a missing persons week and listening to people talk about it, it's ambiguous loss yep. in that people don't know how to say exactly. I'm sorry for your loss because they don't know if you've lost Matt, at yeah. this stage. It's yeah. more than that. They can't, they can't handle the situation because at that stage Matt's feared of being murdered and yeah. uh, it's it's a rare occurrence to a friend of anybody. So they don't know that. They think, well, we can't solve it so they can't talk to you. No one's going to solve it for us but you just like them to reach out and say, look, we're here. That's all. They, they don't, don't need to offer the answers because no one can. Here. That's all, all anybody ever wants, just to know that they've got somebody there even if they don't. It's uh, so. I've got so. It was too confronting for your friends. Yeah, for your, yes. and this yeah. this particular friend years later, she, she finally she was at a supermarket, and we came down the aisle, and she had nowhere to run. <laughs> and she looked at Mark and I, and this is years later, yeah. and she said, and Mark used to be her a tax accountant as well, and she looked at Mark and she said, um, "Oh, we don't use you anymore because we couldn't stand the pain in your eyes." It's yeah. the pain in his his eyes. Yeah. It, it upset her. I mean, she's still got I, her beautiful boys, yeah. and we've got we've 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 lost Maddie. And I, I'm I'm not defending people oh, in that way, but no. people genuinely do but, not know how to deal but, with but it. This is it. But, yeah. but they don't realise by doing that it's hurtful. Yeah, and it's not their fault, and I don't blame her. Uh, one, they just, they just don't know any they better. They just don't know any better. Mm. Mm. But, you know, to be told that, they couldn't stand the pain in his eyes. And yeah. I'm thinking, we often speak to other victims yeah. as well and, and they say, how do you cope? How do you, how do you grieve? And I say, the answer is very simple. There's no right way or wrong way. And there's no mm. time. It's, it's your way. Yeah, that's Whatever works for advice. you is the right yeah. way and that, yeah. that's it. And there's no yeah. time. We've got friends that, you know, five years down track said to me, oh, you should move on. Mm. And I said, No. I said, I'll never move on. I might, I might move forward and I take, we take every day, day by day. And, but you can never move on. You can never, ever move on. That's just like saying Matt's never existed. Uh, it's, it's such a difficult thing. And I, but I, I, um, the William Tyrrell matter uh, with the foster parents and we can't name their names, but yeah. uh, speaking to them and they told me about their decision at what point in time do they drive back from Kendall yeah. Uh, with an empty child seat in the back would of their be car, the most horrendous. Thing. Um, and I, I think that struck me like a lightning bolt. In yeah. that, that's the reality of what uh, what you're dealing with in these circumstances. Yeah, I heard that mentioned on one of the podcasts. Yeah. That, you know, they looked it's... around here that this child seat in the back of the car, yeah, empty. Yeah, my and that's for that's hard. Family, it yeah. really does. It's and with you guys, you're dealing with a situation that your son's disappeared. Your, your concerns are at, uh, yeah, 100%. You're still holding out some degree of hope and you get the knock on the door at your home and there's uh, the local police and uh, homicide uh, detective saying that uh, they're treating it as a homicide. Yep. So what happened from there? From there, well, we might go back to the, to the Thursday night with our yeah, interview with police. Was the first... That was our first interview at the police yeah. station. And we were told to get there at half past two in the afternoon mm. and uh, we went to the interview room at the front of the police station. Yep. Um, the detective who um, we assume was in charge took us into that room and uh, his first comments were rather, I guess, disturbing. Mm. Um, he let us know that um, in the early part of the conversation that uh, he, was um, he was retiring soon. And looking forward to that. That's what the... <laughs> yep. Uh, he, okay. he wasn't homophobic, but he would never go to Mardi Gras. He's never uh, worked on a Mardi Gras and he never will. So I okay. thought, well, okay, I don't know why we need to know all this information, but that was passed on to us at the start. And they made the point that they were, women are more more observant than men. I, I don't just don't argue that. That's, that's probably true uh, mm. or is true. And I said, so we're going to be talking to Faye, not to you. You can sit there, but just you just watch. They wouldn't take a statement from Mark. <sighs> Right, okay. So, okay, off we go and they're in, they're yeah. in phase. And then he's putting for five in, hours into almost. the statement, I, I'd say something, you know, no, we don't need that, we don't need that. And then he's more or less picking and choosing from what I'm saying is mm. what went Well, he's in. the experienced investigator, so we thought, well, okay, he knows yeah. what he wants from so, us. So he'll consequently after name. that, I think I made two other statements after that when yeah. another detective who brought the case together that got it to trial, yeah. we were uh, – um, she put it together because I'd been talking to her and she said, but that's not in your statement. I said, well, I told them, but they didn't want to put it in. And I said, Jason wanted to give a statement mm. and they wouldn't talk to him. 
and this is two months before the trial's going to go ahead, so they're getting a statement from um, from Jason and at first he didn't want to give it, which I don't blame him because he's told it, he was family, he yeah. was too close, so he couldn't give a statement. That confuses me from my uh, police officer's point of view and I, I, I can't make comments on what evidence they put in the statement and whatnot. In the general sense, I'd say that the, the more information, the better in a situation like um, you guys found yourself in. But uh, I'm, I, I will uh, say that it's not the appropriate comment to tell a grieving family, and I think it's fair to say grieving when uh, you're reporting your, your child missing, to um, say I'm retiring in uh, a couple of months. It's we not, were, it's not I the was type always of comment that you want to... I was raised by my parents to, to you know, police are the authority. If you could trust the police, they know what they're doing. I thought, well, that's our starting point. Yeah. Well, you know, the, these people know what they're after. They're, they're competent. They're, they're uh, uh, professionals. And uh, we know better now. But at the time, of course, we, we, we trusted the authorities implicitly. And that's, uh, uh, and I, again, these are things that I've learnt because quite often families that we come into contact with in circumstances like you haven't had dealings with the cops. You, yeah. you haven't had de- detectives knocking on your door. You don't no. know how uh, police operate. and So it's a completely new world to you. Well, to actually, yourself. I have. I had not knock on our door once. Are you off. confessing something here? No, no, I, not, <laughs> not for me. I had to give a statement. Yeah. I'm, I, I, the police were investigating one of my clients. Right, okay. He, he's no longer a client. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I'm sure there's a story in that. Um, so the progress of the investigation. So it's, after a week you've been told it's a homicide, which the connotations are that uh, Matt's been murdered. Yep. Um, you're speaking with police. You're getting statements. You're, with the benefit of hindsight, you're looking back and thinking, well, it could have been done differently. But at mm-hmm. the time you didn't know. You're thinking maybe this is the way the police operate. They get exactly. a statement from one. Yeah. And we're, we're, it was drilled upon us right from the very start. Mm. You mustn't talk to the media. Uh, it can affect the integrity of the brief. Don't talk to any press. So we thought, okay, again, you know what you're talking about. We'll do as we're told. We what, wanna... What's your reading on that from... Uh... We don't know. Uh, at first I thought, well, maybe they've, they've got a suspect and they, mm. they've got a reason for this because on the Wednesday I had a phone call from one of Matt's um, schoolmates saying that she could get the story. She had a contact yeah. in our local paper. And I said, oh, thanks. And that's when we approached the... Pl- no, no, don't say a word. Don't mm. say a word. So we just went with them. Yeah. You know, well, yeah, well, and you, you guys, you, you're in charge of the strategy, so you know what you're doing. So yeah. hey, well, if that's what you say, we'll, we'll just do it. And look, I, I, I don't know. There might have been a reason uh, there that uh, it, it shouldn't go out out in the media. But continuing on, so what's the, the next process for you guys and, and what did you know about the investigation and, and well, how often not, would you be in contact? Well, I'd ring about – in the beginning, I was still nearly ringing every day and then I'd – Every you know second and then weekly, um, and they say no progress. Um, what period of the time are we talking? Oh, this? the first four weeks. But we don't forget yeah. we lost Mel. So yeah. after about two weeks, yeah. a lady who was in charge of the investigation yeah. was found out. Yeah. Um, because another detective had appealed against a promotion position yeah. and won, yeah. our 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 senior person there was being lost to us. Right. And I said, look, you know, we want you. Can't we appeal? Can't we put a statement forward or give an out reference or yeah. do something to keep you in? They said, no, that's not how it works, unfortunately. So yeah. we lost her in charge and uh, had a new detective um, be placed in, in, in charge of the investigation. And um, That was just after Matt's birthday. Yes, it would have been. It yep, would have been. Just before yeah. Christmas and the police were lovely. They'd taken up a uh, collection and on Matt's birthday they'd left – White flowers at our front door with a beautiful card. Yeah, what a lovely gesture that, that, that was! That, that, yeah, that, that was terrific. That, that, that was touching. That Very touching. touching. And yeah. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, that's great. Mm. That's great. And, and then when this detective now put in charge calls us down there, he raked me over the coal saying I'd gone to the media, and the only media we'd been to was after after six weeks they actually did a police media release about Matt missing. Mm. Six weeks had gone and nothing was had been done as such. And we were given by this detective who was um, retiring a reporter's name and said we could talk to him. So, okay, well, for sure, if we can, yeah, now we, we will. And so we were told what we could not couldn't say and we did that. Then when this other detective came on, he grilled me, he had me un- in the room like a suspect, grilling me about going to the media. I said, no, I haven't. I've only told them what I've been told. I could tell them, nothing more, nothing less. And the person we spoke to was one that your colleague... Gave us his card. Right. 
And then he then he then he went on to the the fact about the flowers, how how unprofessional that was of the uh, Miranda police. Now that every every victim that walked through that door, they'd have to do the same thing. And um, he then said it was Matt's lifestyle that had him murdered. And this is just before Christmas. So I turned to him and I said, have you any children? And he said, yes. And I think they were about nine or 11. I can't remember the ages now. And I just said to him, well, I hope you have a lovely Christmas with your family because we won't be. Well, good on you for pushing back. And he just sat there and looked at me. Mm. But um, he had no empathy, no nothing. He was cold as ice. He treated us like we were the enemy, like we had something to do with Matt's murder. Mm. He made it, I, I, I often told, say this, he was the first police officer that made us feel like the police and us were no longer on the same side. I, I, so it was I, that bad. I, but accepting what you say, I, I can't comprehend what you say, how anyone would think that's appropriate in what you've relayed in the conversation that you had. And uh, you use the word empathy and I hear it so many times doing this podcast and it, it makes me think that when I speak to detectives and detectives that I, I rate and value, that they have genuine empathy. And I think that's, that's an important thing. You guys as victims, if you feel like the show of um, empathy with delivering the flowers, yeah. yeah, that means the world to you guys. Exactly. It did. Mm. The, the, exactly. the cops actually care. What yeah, a fabulous exactly. gesture, that's right. Yeah. And then after that he had told the others that... They weren't to talk to us about the case. We ring up, they weren't allowed to talk to us. So we had no communication for a long time out and of Miranda. How did you feel as victims? See, Terrible. the catch is, this is the perception of victims, and I think it's across the board. Um, if, you're, if you hear nothing, if you're told nothing, you perceive nothing's being done. Yeah. And that's just a, a perception. Um, yeah, I've spoken twice at Goldman to the uh, homicide class down there, the police oh, academy, yep. and um, they have victims after and talking to them. And the one of the strong points I make is is just this, is that communications are key. Um, you're not going to say we've solved the matter because that's, that's impossible. Yep. But at least say to the victim, look, it's Billy Boggs this week calling just for an update for you. Uh, we're on the case. Uh, we're um, pursuing our, our leads. We're, we've, uh, we can't discuss anything further with you, but let you know we're, we're still working on it. That's all. That takes yep. 30 seconds. Uh, out of detective's time, and, and that's that's it's not much to ask just for that. And that's such an important message. And, and you've been invited down to the academy to lectures of the homicide course. Is that? Uh, oh, Mark has twice. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think that's good that uh, that message is getting out because anyone that says, and I, I look, whether this ups, upsets the, the cops from my attitude, I quite frankly don't care. But the point is that uh, when you're dealing with someone's disappearance or murder. You need to keep the families informed. That's it's, right. a, it's a prerequisite. And of, yeah, we were told to at that point that they had investigated us as well, and we were not considered suspects. Yeah. And that's that's that's. I'm, I'm pleased that we were checked out. That's, that's appropriate. That's yeah. that's, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. So if we're not suspects, I mean, we do know our other other murder friends who the the killer is within the family. So be, the police must be careful what they say. Exactly. Um, yep. They weren't within our family, so they and, and uh, we believe they trusted us. Um, so that they. Um, and that we got to the point too. We, we were getting requests from press uh, as this started to, yeah. to go on, and uh, we'd always go to the to the head detective first up and say, "Listen, so and so's called from this station or that radio station or newspaper. Um, what can we say?" Mm. And we get a clearance from that. And it's like sometimes they would say, "Now at the moment, say nothing," or right now, looking, you can tell them this fact and that fact, but nothing beyond that. And that so we, we'd follow those guidelines. We you know we, we never went went out broadcasting anything without out their consent yeah. first of all. And look, if if you've done it that way, um, it can oh, it confuses me the concern of you going to the media because quite obviously you're, you're reasonable people and uh, you're uh, running anything past what you do past. Yeah. See, past the we place. know better now, uh, but back in those days, okay, we were, what, we're not. What, what, what's your well? No, actually, we'll cover it at the end. <laughs> what your thoughts are because that uh, I, I want just pe I want people to feel what you were going through at the time. So well, I'll, I'll, you, can you're I dealing. A, can I give us a? Um, I want to give you two examples. I'll start with one now. This is yep. early on. Um, Matt's belongings were starting to be returned to us. Yes. And I want to try and paint a picture for you. Um, I was there at the kitchen bench. Well, you've been that same bench in yep. the kitchen. And uh, a detective sat there with me and brought back a few of Matt's things in a box, as well as Matt's computer satchel. 
It was a quality leather satchel for his, his MacBook yep. and uh, with a flap over the top and it was locked. There were, the police had Matt's computer from the start, so his computer yep. wasn't in the satchel. But um, when I said to the police, there's, there's something in this satchel. They said, oh, no, 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 it's uh, we can't open it. And it, it was locked. And yep. uh, I said, well, this is a, a murder investigation. Is, is there anything more important than this? Wouldn't you get a hammer and smash the lock or a mm. knife and cut the leather? We don't care. We've got to see what's in this, this, this satchel. Oh, no, no, no. We didn't want to damage the bag. And so here I, I'm holding the satchel. And there's a flap one side. The other side, there's a little zippered zip section that wasn't locked. And I just happened to pull the zip back and put my hand in. And I said, this wouldn't be the key, would it? <laughs> and uh, sure enough, turn, click, it was open. Yeah. So I thought, well, how thorough are these people? They can't even open a bag and uh, look in a, in a back pocket for and a key. And the fact, too, there was a couple of um, memory was cards in there. Which they, they didn't turn out to be anything. Yeah. But they yeah. could have been. Yeah. We, they didn't know that. Yeah. We didn't yeah. know that. Okay, so you're dealing with, you've got two two issues running here. You, your son's disappeared. And then uh, the police investigation, you're dealing with all the nuances of um, the good, the bad and everything else that comes yep. with the investigation. At what point in time did you start to um, feel that uh, Atkins had some knowledge or involvement in Matt's disappearance? From the beginning. That's my yeah. He, his lack of cooperation from yep. the start and the more we're hearing and uh, um, just trying to think now, we... I wore a listening device twice with Atkins to, to, to speak to him when Faye was present. And um, before one of those visits to his place, the police, the first time we'd been told that Atkins had bought a mattock and cloth tape from Bunnings mm. on the day after Matt goes missing, or the day Matt goes missing. And um, they said, now this information, although that's upsetting, you cannot tell a soul. You cannot tell a single soul. It can affect the integrity of the brief. So again, we thought, look, you guys know what you're doing. We don't. We, the last thing we do is hurt the investigation. So we won't tell a sign. We know they told Fane, oh, they were angels that had this information. We told nobody, nobody. And not not two weeks after we were told this information, Faye hears from, um, a let's say, a hairdresser that, what's this I hear about Atkins buying a pick and shit from Bunnings? Right. She'd heard it from a client who'd been to a masseuse and then when I rang the police up, naturally I'm straight on the phone. Yeah. Um, they rang the hairdresser. There was a bit of a reluctancy for the person who relayed this information to the hairdresser to give him the information. And it turned out it wasn't at, it might, mightn't have been the masseuse, it might have been at a pub. So they just brushed it under the thing. They said, don't worry about it. It's okay. not detrimental to the case. And hey, listen, you just said to us before that we couldn't tell a soul. We couldn't even tell our boys, which today, and even today, they hate us for that because we kept that information you didn't from... didn't tell the yeah. boys. Okay. I, I think at this point in time, we'll, we'll just paint the picture of the circumstances, what we know. So we're, we're talking... How how long after Matt's disappearance are we talking? That this about three months we did this in the box? Uh, it was right, uh, at Christmas time? About Christmas okay. time. Yeah. The, the circumstances, and, and, and jump in if, if I'm... Uh, mistelling it, but the circumstances was Matt, uh, Matt was last seen alive at our nightclub yep. and according to um, Atkins, uh, he actually came home that night. Yeah, he came home with him. With, with him. Yep. And then uh, Atkins went to bed and mm -hmm. then this is his version that he, he maintained yep. at this particular point yep. in time and woke up and uh, Matt had Matt disappeared. Matt had disappeared, yeah. And what we also know, and at different times this evidence came in because I just want to explain to the, the um, listener the type of information that you were becoming aware of, that uh, when the police, and you talk about uh, a pick or a matic um, that he purchased at Bunnings, that was on the Sunday. So we're talking the, the Sunday, Sunday, lunchtime. Sunday lunchtime, Atkins has gone to Bunnings and purchased a pick and some duct tape. Mm-hmm. Police were aware of that because of a receipt that was found in the car. Matt's phone, I believe, was also found in his Atkins' own car under the car under the carpet in the passenger passenger side. Okay, and also a big um, boombox. Is it called? Is that what's the right terminology? That was missing That's the right from term. Matt's yeah. car, car, but that was wasn't missing. found out till months down the track because twice they took Matt's car the yeah. first time when they found it down at the park. And they brought it back to us and it was locked. Okay, sorry. And just to uh, inform people, Matt's car was found abandoned in a 
car park. Waratara Oval. At the, uh, we at should the backtrack, Oval. though, to Faye's police interview. Yep. At the conclusion of the Faye's interview, they said to Faye at that point, look, we can tell you now, we couldn't mention it before in case it influenced what you were saying, mm. we found Matt's car this morning. Okay. That was the Thursday. Uh, locked up in a park in Sutherland. Um, it was locked up. There was no signs of a struggle or blood. Uh, it was just locked up and found in, in, in a parking area at this park. Mm. And um, luckily, this is Atkins' um, fatal mistake. He left in the back, in the boot area of the car, a receipt from Bunnings. Yep. Bunnings at Tarrant Point, uh, which dated and timed. And the detectives went across there and got pretty good quality CCTV footage, which you've seen as well, yeah. um, of the checkout area at Bunnings. You'll see Atkins arriving, and about seven minutes later, he's at the checkout with his mannequin cloth tape. Yep. And his version of events, he was at home. He hadn't gone out. That's right. Yeah. Well, yeah, initially, they, they locked went, him into that. in his first... Well, what we, we do know is that after our interview with the police, Atkins was interviewed as well. Yep. This on the Thursday, and um, in the... Um, it's called the ERISP. Uh, the electronically recorded interview of a suspect person, um, it was a videotaped interview with Atkins, um, it was put to him that um, uh, he was buying the Matic uh, and tapered Bunnings and uh, he said, no, it wasn't him. They offered to show him the, the, the footage. Yep. He didn't wish to watch that. Would wish to watch that. Yeah. So a la- from a layman's point of view, you'd be looking, well, this is why is someone buying a Matic and, and duct tape okay. and uh, yeah. why are you saying you didn't go out when you're in fact... You did go out yeah. and you bought a Matic and uh, coupled with uh, that came later the fact that the uh, the boom box that was in the boot of Matt's car, um, you couldn't fit anything in the boot because it took up the majority of the it boot. Did. That, sure had, did. that had been, uh, moved. been removed. Yeah. And, Matt, and what, what they found was it had been removed hastily because there was bare wires where it had been. So it had just been ripped out. Ripped out. Yeah. yeah. And Matt's car was um, found abandoned, locked at a, a yep. um, box right. no, of the overs. No keys. Uh, Waratah. Waratah. And how far roughly was that from... It was probably from our place, only about uh, three k's three from k's. our place, I guess. Okay. Now, you mentioned that uh, you wore a listening device on Atkins twice, and that was at the request of uh, the police? Yes, it was. Uh, can you tell us circumstances well, there? the police asked us in the early stage of the investigation, look, we may ask one of you to do something for us. If we do, you can't tell the other person. Um, again, it can affect integrity of brief. So I said, okay, sure, whatever you, you know, you know us by now. So whatever you need us to do, we will do. Yeah. And um, they ran me one day and said, we, we've, um, we want you to um, wear a device and, and go and check the Atkins. Faye can go with you. And uh, I think the first time we were, we were getting Matt's belongings back, that right? Yeah, I, I was, meet, oh, we were going together. Then I got told Mark would meet me down there because he had to, he, made up an excuse and I was going down there with my cousin to pick yeah. up Matt's belongings. Yeah. And I'd gone via the police station. Um, we were told by the police to well, – I was told by the police uh, an innocuous phrase. And if I said this innocuous phrase twice in succession, if we feared at any stage for our safety, they were coming in with weapons drawn. Right. Um, and uh, we didn't, of course, have to use that. So we went and saw Atkins to recover a lot of Matt's belongings, which he had packed up for us already. Mm-hmm. And also his sister was there as well at the same time. His sister, solicitor, solicitor. All oh, yes, right, okay. Yeah. Um, the, well, then solicitor. Yeah. Um, and um, he shook my hand when we arrived. His hand, like he had a, had a bath or a shower. Yeah. His hand was soaking wet from sweat. Yes. He was soaking wet and and hot, like he was nervous. Um, he poor Faye. We could we had we had to gather on the proviso of uh, he was Matt's boyfriend and he wouldn't be involved. So uh, Faye gave the bastard a hug. Um, so and, this was to keep the narrative going that yeah. you still believed him? and uh, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Okay. And then that was the first occasion. We got really nothing from him. Yeah. Um, then the second occasion, the police said, well, we're listening to the device. We've got to get a Supreme Court warrant. And the window of these are 28 days. Yep. So there's still time to go on that listening device warrant. So uh, we can go back again in that 28 days and have another go. Yep. We said, sure. So um, we went down again. This time, I think Faye knew I had the device yeah. on. Um, and we sort of go there on, I guess, on the premise that we know you're a good guy. Why would the police think you've had any hand in Matt's death? You know, that, that, that's okay. like they, so that was the, the narrative yeah, that you were going and, to spin. Yeah, and just try and see what, what information we can solicit from him. And I, I kick myself to this day because um, I, I said to him um, along the lines of, uh, the police say you bought a manic and, and, and cloth tape from Bunnings. And the first time he actually admitted that, he said, yeah, yeah, well, I just wanted to, do it for, to build a vegetable patch in the, in the property here. So he first, the first time he actually admitted having those, those items. Mm. But the, the question I didn't ask him, which, again, I'm not a trained investigator, yeah. which I kicked myself for, 
I should have asked, well, where are they now? Yeah, yeah. And I never did. Mm. In hindsight, it's a great oh, thing. Oh, look, I, I think the, the amount of pressure you're under, I don't know. I don't think but you I'm, should be too hard on yourself. But, but the, when did you find out about the Matic and the duct tape? Before that visit. Five before minutes, the, the second visit. Five minutes right, before so that they just, sent I was us being, out the I was door. being wired up to go down there. Faye was within the police station yeah. and the detectives told us that uh, this information right yeah. then. Yeah. And Faye's thinking, God, the bastard chopped that up or uh, with this Matic. We, we didn't know. It must have been, uh, from a parent's point of view, extremely hard for you. It was. F- it was facing. Yeah. yeah. And well, trying to hold together and, and be, yeah. be lucid and, and, and sane well, where you're we'll you know, probably done. Trying mm. to get his trust. And what, what really hurts me is when I when we got back to the police station. That was at Cronulla, that police Cronulla, station. I w- they went off at me because I didn't go into my bull terrier mode. Right. I didn't start attacking him, demanding answers. And I said, no, I wanted to gain his trust yeah. and they said oh don't be stupid you're never going to gain his trust mm. well they tell us that now <laughs> it, it's uh, look it's a difficult situation i'm mm. not saying it's a, the wrong approach like if, if they're trying to uh, find out what's happened to matt but i can see from your point of view how difficult that would be and that put being put in that circumstances so eventually he was charged yep. yeah he was what well, after a lot of lobbying and complaining about the lack of progress, lack of communication, lack of professionalism in our investigation. And that complaining from you guys? Yep. Yes, and, uh, us and also a victim's group as well. And uh, how, how did you, uh, how did you um, lodge those complaints? By letter. By letter and writing right. to the uh, uh, officer in charge of, of Miranda. Yep. Um, I think that's as high as we went at that stage, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, Hiron. Hiron? Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, and um, they brought in a, a, another senior detective, um, who actually lived in the Sutherland Shire, and, and uh, she really took the investigation, shook it by the teeth, and got it ready for for, for Atkins to be charged. And um, uh, it was sixth of August, I'm pretty sure, the following year, mm. uh, not quite a year after that was killed, that uh, he was charged with Matt's murder, and um, arrested. Okay. And that was interesting because what they did when he was charged and arrested, this happened at, in the early hours of the morning, about six, seven o'clock in the morning. And uh, he was taken to Miranda Police Station for charging. And um, that afternoon, um, he was to appear in Sutherland Court yes. uh, for the formal charge to be laid. And uh, um, his solicitor, based in the city, yeah. uh, they sent out a junior person by train. Yeah. They got lost. They couldn't find Miranda Police Station. And they said, listen, sunshine, and when, when she rang the police station, you're like, here soon, the, the courts will be closed the night and your boy stays in overnight. Yeah. Um, we got to the court before the court shut for the for police to do. Atkins wouldn't come into court to face his accusers. He stayed down the cells below yeah. court, which meant he voluntarily stayed on remand for 13 months in Silverwater until the trial started the right. following uh, August. Okay. So for 13 months, he, where he could have uh, um, uh, applied for, for bail or, or, or made right. application, he did not. He went. He stayed inside for 13 months in prison. How did you? How did you feel when someone was actually charged? Flat. For that? Flat. Yeah. Oh, because it, and and so people understand. You still haven't got answers. We no. Still haven't got there, answers. There's no no admissions made, and you haven't got Matt's body. No. It was it was in one one. Part of me was happy, was behind bars, and another part it was flat. It was like a nothing win because, as you said, we still didn't have any answers. He wasn't talking. He didn't care. He was wearing Matt's tie, who he, he reckons he doesn't wear Matt's tie. Every every court appearance, he, he turned you seen up that red with, tie. That, yeah, that's Matt's. That's Matt's. That would have hurt. It did. Mm. It hurt yeah. very much. So, so you, you've got the person charged with your son's murder wearing your son's clothes. Yep. And we're thinking too, in the back of our head, you know, prison's a dangerous place and, and uh, the only person that knows where Matt is yeah. is this mongrel. Yeah. And if any happens to him inside, we'll never get answers. Yeah. I, I can understand your concern because part of it, and I've dealt with a lot of uh, victims and where the body hasn't been recovered, that seems to be an additional pain that adds, yep. adds to the pain. No doubt. No because doubt. it's mm. – and we, we won't use the word closure for how you've – but there's no resolution. There there is no. no. Too many un- – yeah, it left, it left them with too many unanswered questions. I yeah. mean, even now we don't know really the true story. Nobody yeah. – there's only two people that know the true story, Atkins and Maddie can't tell us. Yeah. So the trial – so he's charged roughly 12 months after 
Matt's yeah, disappearance. Yeah. And the trial went from the thing with the And f- this would must just consume you. Oh, oh it, it does. You, it's, you, it's, it's all. And over that next 12 months before the trial start, we were at the police station many times getting state, giving statements and yeah. looking at evidence they've got there and checking things. And uh, of course, this, this new detective in charge did involve us. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we were often asked to clarify things for them, and, and uh, uh, which we, we did, you know, did, did if we could. And um, what made matters worse, too, there was, I think, 12 or 13 sightings of Maddie. And they didn't bother getting the CCT footage at that time. Yeah. So when they went back to get it, a lot of it was gone. So it was all hearsay. So and, that and, had to be disproved. And these signs and that, that they, they were brought into, in, when, when the trial occurred, they actually brought into court by the, by the prosecution. Right. Uh, to say that Matt has been seen at these places, but they will then discount those accounts and, yeah. as, as not accurate or not, not, not positive. Yeah. Um, and these are people who are not malicious, just well meaning. So I've seen that face somewhere and they just, that, and it, 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 they think it's, I, think I, I, I have seen it so many times and it, it's something that as my experience level went up in homicide and, and what I was taught by people way more experienced than myself, the importance of making sure these so-called sightings are, uh, yeah, followed up yeah. to be discounted invariably. Yeah. I might have been seen at Hayman Island, Alice Springs, out to the court where the trial was at Darlinghurst once. Yeah. Um, down, down at Sutherland. Sutherland. Uh, down at Carbon Campbelltown, I think it may yeah. have been. So. And, and that, you, you're quite right. It's not by um, people malicious. No, not at all. They not genuinely all. think they, yes, they see do. that, but it yeah. needs to be, and it's so important. Yeah. It needs to be fo- properly explored and investigated. Exactly. Well, they had well, to, that one and because Campbell. there were these that they, they, you know, could be accurate, mm. they had to bring them into court, question the person uh, under, under cross-examination, yeah. and they discounted it as being inaccurate. But so that, the, how long did the murder trial run for? Six weeks. Six weeks. And that's... And it went over. It went over. It was supposed to be a six-week trial and went about eight. Yeah. Six, yeah. six weeks out of your life, obviously. And, oh, well, your life was some of the most traumatic. I, I, again, this, again, busy time. I was, I was seeing clients every night through the trial. Yeah. yeah. We've got to pay our bills, so we had to go and do that. And how did it feel from your point of view, like that you, you're so invested in what's happening and there's such a disconnect for everyone in court because it seems to be discussed at a level that you know, people don't understand? It or, is. It's, or it's not happening because it, it's, it's, it's nothing it's, like you see on TV, nothing at all. And, and there's a good, I'd say, quarter of the time in our trial yeah. where the defence and prosecution are arguing over what evidence can come into the be allowed to be coming to court. Yeah, uh, they're, they're arguing over, over points of the evidence act, what the jury can and can't hear. So the jury get dismissed for a moment. They have their argument, it goes either way, and then they come back in again. And, and, and they, from layman's point of view, and I, I, you've certainly got the experience now through through the pain that you've gone through. But you're looking at that, and you're seeing how much information is not actually going to the jury. No, oh, hurt. did my that word. shock you? Oh my god, it did. And some parts that they do get to hear, it's boring as batshit. I mean, you, you've got the um, uh, there was DNA evidence found in Matt's car, yep. um, and of course both Matt and Atkins share each other's car. So of yep. course Atkins DNA is on the car too. That's yep. no, that's a no brainer. But um, there was parts of DNA on Matt's car. The chance of it not being Atkins was one one in four point six million. Yeah. Other parts where they found Atkins DNA in Matt's car, the chance of not being him was one in eight hundred thousand. Yep. Now, why are those two percentages different? Mm. That took a day the to explain to the jury. Going to sleep. And they're, and, and, they're and nodding off. It is, and, diffi- and it is w- difficult for the yeah. jury to yeah. understand, uh, oh, understand the and complexity Matt's, of it. Matt's phone was. Um, see, Atkins had Matt's phone in his car. Yeah, tell us uh, through that because I think that, that's interesting. Every so often he'd turn his part, Matt's phone on, yeah. we, we believe, to check messages and look at Matt's phone. Mm. And uh, it pinged on a, on a tower near Hurstful, yeah. uh, which is the way Atkins used to drive to work. And then they had a, a, uh, an expert from a, uh, a telecommunications company come in and explain to the jury how triangulation works, so they could say the, the, the yeah. area the phone pinged from. Yeah. That took half a day. Yeah. Uh, it's just basic geometry. But, and, uh, and with the phone too, there was messages sent to Matt's yeah, phone so from, baby, you know. from Atkins. My, yep. Yeah, he was, he was built, again, alibi and, building. Yeah. Uh, baby, I miss you. How are you? I'm worried. And uh, the please phone, call me. the phone was in the um, console mm. a- area. I thought under the carpet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. just uh, tucked yeah. Un- under the carpet. Yeah. When, when police did the search warrant of Atkins' car, uh, of the unit on the mm. on the Thursday, yeah. uh, Atkins was interviewed after after us, and the police had said to Atkins that morning, I believe, we want to interview the, interview this evening. Come down to Miranda Police Station. He said, "Well, look, I'm working at um, Glen Denning. Glen Denning." Um, I'll be a good two, you know, two hours from the police station, but I'll come there straight from work. They said, well, thank you for that. He didn't know because he was working at Northmead. So that's his first lie. 
Yeah. But he didn't know there's police outside watching him at Northmead. Yeah. And the police tell us that he 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 drove not to the police station. He left Northmead and went straight to the unit at Cronulla. When he got to the unit at Cronulla, he saw uniformed police and realised there was police following him as well there, waiting for him. Uh, he had to be helped to the ground as he was semi-collapsing at that, ta- that time. Right. He got out of his car. He, this, is, this has never been explained and no one knows why. He got out of his car wearing a work boot and a jogger. sports shoe jogger. Why? On no one knows. No one knows. So they took him to the police station at that point and did a search of a unit that evening. And um, in the search that evening of the unit, uh, it went many hours into the early hours of the morning. Went down to the garage where the, his car was parked in a common area of the garage. There was common areas where a few cars were parked together in the garage, yep. and uh, they um, heard, or I think I heard, a, or felt a buzzing sound um, in when they were searching Atkins' car. They thought that they activated an alarm, or what, 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 what's causing this? And they realised no, that was when they took it down to forensics. Yes, and 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 they you know, that's when they found the phone found the buzzing phone. away in the car. Mm. Okay, now. With the trial, six weeks, there was evidence and that you were, were aware of yep. that wasn't presented to the court. A lot. A lot. Um, what were the things that really shocked you and I, I would imagine disappointed you that uh, the, it wasn't presented? The fact that he wasn't cautioned properly in an interview initially uh, when they did the first error at, at the uh, police station at Miranda. Right. Uh, this was conducted by a local detective and a detective from Homicide, yep. a trained homicide investigator. They, because of the way the interview was conducted, there were things that, that, that couldn't be used in court. For instance, although the jury was shown the Bunnings footage, they couldn't hear Atkins' denial that he knew there went Bunnings, he didn't go there. They couldn't hear that, that, that major lie. And um, any jury would have been clear from the footage it was him in, in that shop. Um, Did that um, confuse you and frustrate you? Yep. Fr- not confused, frustrate. Yeah, frustrate. yeah. yeah. mate, it's very annoyed. Very so annoyed. the jury get shown images of him in Bunnings, but the jury weren't informed of the fact that uh, he denied going there. Correct. Exactly. See, the the redacted version of the errors the jury got to see yeah. was probably about two hours, I think. Is that right, Faith? About yeah. two hours, yet the errors lasted three and a half. Right. So that much they didn't get to see. Plus the fact that one of the times when he had a, another young boy back at the unit, uh, his sister turned up. Mm. And they hid. They went out the back way and hid. Now, they didn't get to hear that full version right. that he was hiding from his sister. Um, there was another one where the money, more, more money and drugs were found months after Matt had been missing, yet because they'd taken the first lot. Yep. But somehow the second lot was still Matt's. He claimed so, no Matt's. Well, right. like Matt's, so, so wait, wait, Matt come back, did he? That, that couldn't yeah. go into court at all. Right. So that never got... And the, what frustrated us, the, the prosecution didn't argue yeah. much yeah. about having these items omitted from the... Um, they, let, let, they let the defence win most of these objections. Mm. And when we challenged and questioned the prosecution about that strategy, yeah. they said, look, the reason being, if we argue too much, it gives him more ground to appeal if he gets convicted. So that's mm. where we go, we go light on some of those. Yeah, yeah. It's seen... Odd to us, but that we're again we're, we've been following the professionals. And they they know better than we do. And yeah. then they said to us too that because we're all witnesses, the family, because um, we'd had seen Maddie just before and and that, and they said, don't worry, um, the defence they won't they won't come down hard on you. Well, they grilled me that I didn't know Matt's age, or they tried to tell me Matt was. Born on different so day. So when you're giving evidence at your son's murder trial. Yep. And because I said his eyes were bluey green and that I, I had a hateful relationship with my with my son, which really that, that devastated me to say that Matt and I had a bad relationship, which we didn't. Uh, we had a normal relationship, a normal loving relationship. Yes, we had words, but every family has mm. words. And he was like, Matt led, led a d- double life. I didn't know Matt at all. Um, and he really ripped into me and then... It's brutal, isn't it? It's horrible. And I s- start to break down and the judge offered me five minutes and I said, no, no, I'm fine. And then I had to watch my two sons get ripped apart, especially Peter and then Jason. Jason, they called a lie because the detective hadn't taken his his statement and because it only got taken a few months before the trial... 
defence was saying that Jason was lying, he was trying to protect his brother, he was you a get, liar. You get to think of this, when, yeah. when he could have wiped up that statement so early on. Not only yeah. did I get ripped apart and was hurtful, I then had to sit and watch my sons get ripped apart, then I had to watch Mark get ripped apart, and we were the innocent victims in this. Yeah, the victims. See, what was we're frustrating, you, you couldn't... You couldn't uh, go into court until you testified in case yeah. what you hear might, might take yeah. you to say. You know how that, that works. And, yeah. and they said, but don't worry, you're all the family, so we'll get you all on first. Yeah. Great. Faye was first. I think a work colleague was second, and the boys were third and fourth. So that yeah. they're in. Where's Mark down the witness list? Yeah. Number 19. Oh, how, how frustrating was did terrible. you feel? No, frustrating is just not the word. Okay. I couldn't yeah. go and see my own son's murder trial. It was, it was hor- horrific. And we, it was over two weeks before I got into court. We thought and they, Mark was going to have a stroke. He was just unbearable. They yeah. wanted to bring me in at a point in time where they bring up the listening device. Yeah. And I got in the witness box and I was only in for half an hour. Mm. And the defence objected what they were about to be told. Yeah. And so I got kicked out again for another week. Well, they argued that and um, was brought in later. It, it put, look... I don't want to uh, criticise the courts because smarter people than I, um, yeah, are involved in running the courts, obvi- obviously. But it's just shameful some of the things that go on. It and, is. Uh, yeah, when, when you look at it, when you're telling this story, I, I can see the pain and feel the pain that you're talking about now, and the frustration and the and the anger and. And uh, what's what's annoying too is the sham that goes on in there, where you Atkins who comes in a prison van each morning from the from Silverwater, mm-hmm. and he's probably in his greens. He gets changed into a nice suit and tie, comes up in the witness box. Uh, it's in the, it's not, sorry, it's in the in the, um, in the dock. dock, I should say. Yeah. He sits in the dock, and uh, next thing he can come to the jury. Mm. He sees his bug legs there sitting nice and clean and shiny, and uh, the evening, the jury's dismissed, and he's, he's let out by the guards. During the course of the trial, were you confident that you'd get a result? We, we, uh, and uh, as a result, as in uh, 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 guilty? Talking to our detectives, no. they no. were sort of thinking positively. Yeah. Um, uh, prosecutor was thinking positively. Yep. They were pleased with the demographic of the jury they got when they did the jury selection. Yep. When the jury, they're out for five days deliberating, five and a mm-hmm. half days. And after the, uh, the first, uh, first few hours, they said, oh, you're on, we can't reach a verdict. He said, you're kidding, come back out and do your job and yeah, can't go over yeah. the old evidence again. So after a few more days, they, they come in and say, your honour, can you give us the distinction, please, in layman's terms between manslaughter and murder? Right. And his honour said, look, well, I can. It's, it's, the, it's the intent component. You know, with murder, uh, you intend to cause serious personal harm or death. Um, in mass law, there's no intent. They start you have it that the intent wasn't there, and off they go with it. With, well, that's that's a good question. That that's a reasonable question. Then about a day later, back in another question, um, Your Honour, can you tell us what reasonable doubt means? And he said, Look, I'm sorry, I, I can't. The High Court directs that reasonable doubt is what you think it is, not what I think it is. So it's up to you to decide what that means. Yeah. Now we think they are confused with no doubt, not reasonable doubt. That's our that's our only yeah. our only best guess. And a little more time goes by, and they still couldn't reach a verdict. Then um, Justice Hidden, the judge, he gave them what's called the black direction. Yep. That's where they were allowed to find the person guilty or innocent. Um, by a majority rather than unanimous verdict. So if the if the verdict was eleven to one rather than twelve nil, yeah. uh, they weren't to tell the court that, but uh, that that would be enough to, to get them over the line. So within and, and that that set up to, in case there's someone that's a, going against the flow yeah, of the rest of the yeah, jury. Yep. Yeah, and um, then within probably hours, I guess, of that direction. Yeah, they came back. Um, and what what had happened was too because we'd gone way over time with our trial, we'd lost our court. A new yep. trial had started. Um, so we got moved to a much smaller court um, up at Darlinghurst there where they brought in the verdicts. And in the smaller court, uh, we would have been, oh, no more than th- two or three minutes from the, from the end juror. They were right close yeah, to us and, yeah. and uh, it was a much tiny, much closer. Yeah, I know None the courts, of them would look at us. They yeah. walked in when they called Heads the down, jury. Nobody would look at us. And then I here? got the bad feeling. Is that, is that when you guys thought that well, yeah, the, the first. Yeah. Well, the first thing was that the, uh, the judge said, how do you find the defendant on the, on the charge of murder? Yep. And the foreman said, not guilty, Your Honour. And not unsurprised, well, you know, probably they, they, they're having trouble with that intent component, it'll be manslaughter. Um, then he said, how do you find him on the charge of manslaughter? And again, not guilty. Um, that's when we were, we were gobbledsmacked. The, the yep. prosecutor uh, was trembling and shaking. Um, our police detective was trembling, shaking and vomiting. Mm. Um, Atkins Barrister had gone to a, off to a new trial. Yeah. And his uh, assisting counsel was there in the, in the court. Yeah. His instructor's list were there in the court to hear uh, the verdict. And uh, she was there open mouth, gobsmacked. Yeah. Um, 
the judges' assistants up on the bench, we saw that their faces were just ones of horror and shock. Mm. We were all the above. But Atkins was the most chilling of all. He's a person who'd been in prison for 13 months and told, you're a free man, off you go. Yeah. Nothing. Not no a, reaction. Just blank. Nothing. The, not no guilt, emotions. no emotions, no remorse, nothing. wasn't even relieved, mm. which shocked us more than anything. You, surely a person in that standing would be, oh, thank God. At last, I'm free. At last, nothing. I'm free, nothing. Yeah. I know the uh, prosecutor on the case, very experienced prosecutor. We won't, won't uh, mention the name, but no. uh, it impacted uh, with the prosecutor too. My word. Su- yeah, so he, he, was, he was trembling and shaking. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you said the police officer was vomiting. Yeah. As well. Yeah. 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 Outside vomiting. That's the impact it had on the police officer. My word. You know, they, yeah, they, they put their lives into this investigation and case and, uh, yeah. and uh, without being cocky, thought they were, were, were a re- reasonable chance yeah. of... But I mean, you you think back about all this. Just you know, I say this to fake a lot often to other friends as well. Look at the big picture here. What if, what if Atkins had been convicted of murder? Mm. Okay, what happens then? He goes inside. He's still denying any involvement in Matt's, Matt's death at that yeah. stage. So we'd have got some satisfaction. This bastard's been locked up, mm. but we don't get Matt back. Well, I and that, that's it. <laughs> by, by by him getting off, we're getting the inquest path, etc. And we are able to bring Matt home. Look, I'll, I'll bring it. We'll uh, we'll get some uh, fresh uh, drinks. Uh, bring it to closure here, and we'll come back. And then we're going to talk about uh, what you did in not giving up that led to uh, recovering Matt's body, which I, I think is an extraordinary uh, extraordinary tale and testament to uh, your guys' courage and tenacity. But just reflecting on what you've uh, told me now, and that's giving an insight. And I've been involved in this world a lot in in homicide, but I think. Uh, You've really brought it down to uh, the impact it, it has on you, and it's not something you're gonna, ever going to walk away from. It's not something yeah. that's going to give you closure. It, it's changed the people you are. Oh, um, that's a very important because now we normal. have now, as face it, we now have a new normal. Yeah, so, some people said, normal. "Oh, well, now Matt's been found. You're back to normal." No, we're back to a new normal now. That's yeah, new. yeah. Now, your life before was never ever be the same as it is now. You're very different people from yeah. that yeah. day you first found out. Yeah. Matt, you you lose your innocence, I think, in some aspects. Yeah, you're not. I mean, nobody's totally innocent, but that bit of innocence you've got and that oh, everything's going to be all right. You lose that. Yeah. You we have new, new friends now as well. We call them our homicide friends. Yeah, yeah others who have yeah. lost somebody as well, and yeah. uh, there's things we can talk about with them that other people might find macabre and silly. But I, that's I, what we do. Look, I understand that that what you guys have been through. I, the only people that can say they've walked in your footsteps are people that've been through the same thing. And I, I fully get that. And this man sounds silly, but at some point you can't stay bitter and twisted. And even as you know, mm. when we're searching for Maddie, yeah. you have to have those light moments. They might yeah. be macabre, they might be weird, but you've got to have that laugh because if you don't laugh, you're you're just curling that little ball and yeah. you'll never get up again. Oh, I understand that. I know you guys understand that you've got to find some joy in, yeah. in all the pain that yeah. you've been through. Yeah. Mm. But let's, uh, let's have a break and uh, come back shortly. Great. Cheers. Thank you. This podcast series is brought to you by True Crime Australia. Visit iCatchKillers.com.au for additional materials such as articles on what you heard, videos and galleries. You can search for the iCatch Killers with Gary Jubal and official group on Facebook and join in with discussion. See you for the next episode of the podcast. Cast. 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 Cast.